Bangasso Library. I am delighted to see the room is packed for this. Um, this is a talk that I'm really, really excited to introduce. I just have to point a few things out beforehand. Um, the emergency exits are over here, so the door that you just came in from, and another door here. I hope you won't need them, but just so you know. And I'm going to pass you over now to the lovely Bernie Doherty. Uh, thanks very much, Abby, and thanks to all the staff here at uh, Balmastow Library for accommodating today's talk. Um, people coming in, there's three chairs here up at the top. You're very lucky to get the front seats. Um, delighted to see such a, 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 a group of people here today, and I'm really, really delighted to be able to introduce Fiona, who worked with Atlantic Archaeology during, uh, for a number of years, as you're all aware of the works that were carried out here in Balmaslow. It's really, really, I, it's really important for us to be able to showcase the archaeology that, that held up, in inverted commas, the works that were going on. Um, but this is just uh, to give you an idea and a little glimpse of just it's just the scratching on the surface, the amount of work that goes on um, within the archaeological archeolo archeolo sector um, between planning, archaeologists are involved with the planning during the actual works themselves, but also during post-excavation and the work which Fiona has been carrying out here in Ballinasloe is, is just exemplary. So, here she is, it's Fiona, so a warm welcome and I hope you enjoy the talk. Okay, thank you. And I have to say um, thank you all very much for coming. Um, I didn't expect so many people uh, to show up today. Um, can you can't hear me? Can you hear me now? No. <coughs> Sorry, um, Back now? Is that better? Okay, great. Okay, thanks a million. Okay, so uh, the Big Dig, um, otherwise known as the Balance Slope Water Services um, Upgrade and Town Enhancement Scheme, uh, commenced in July 2018 and was the largest infrastructure development undertaken since the modern town was established in the late 18th and early 19th centuries. So, works were undertaken, as you know, on the three principal streets of the town, so on Main Street. Society Street and Dunlow Street, in St. Michael's Square, Bridge Street, uh, Crea, Sarsfield Road, Sarsfield Drive, St. Joseph's Place, and Cora Park, and Sheena Howell as well, in the area around the, the council offices. So the main contractors in the project were SIAC, um, who carried out the work on behalf of Galway County Council and Irish Water, and Ryan Hanley were the consulting engineers for the project. So um, Atlantic Archaeology then were engaged as the consultant archaeologists for the project. Um, and pretty much it was my job to manage the impact, if any, on the archaeology and eventually actually the architectural heritage as well. You can't hear me down the back, can you not hear me? Is it better with this one? Okay, perfect, okay. Okay, so um, although considerable disturbance had taken place below ground, a number of archaeological features were identified during the course of the project. So what I propose to do today is just talk about one aspect of it rather than throw the whole lot at you because quite a bit was found. So what we're going to do today is have a look at the archaeology that was found on Society Street and around Church Hill. So what did we find on Society Street and around Church Hill? Well, we found the remains of the cemetery, a well and a well house um, in 2020, and subsequent research may also have identified um, an early church that was associated with the cemetery. So they, the dates that we got back um, from the burials, they dated to between the 15th and the 17th century. And this was a period of time in Ireland that saw huge changes in Irish society. 
So it spanned the conquest of Ireland. Um, it marked a change from a feudal clan-based system um, to one that was governed from England. Um, the 16th and 17th centuries were marked um, by numerous wars and repeated outrages. And at the same time, the wider, in the wider world, sorry, I have to put on the glasses. <laughs> I should have done that from the beginning. So um, at the same time in the wider world, Shakespeare was writing plays, Caravaggio was creating works of art, and Magellan was attempting to circumnavigate the world. So this was the era of Henry VIII, of Grace O'Malley, of Ronnie Whale, Elizabeth Tudor, the plantation of Ireland, and the monstrous uh, Oliver Cromwell. So these people, the, the remains of these people, they would have lived through momentous times. Okay, Bernie, it's way too. So before we begin to discuss the findings from the excavation, I'm just going to put Balan Slow kind of very briefly into context. Um, there can be little doubt about the strategic importance of the area from earliest times. So it's located, as you can see from the aerial photograph here, it's located on a fording point on the River Suck and adjacent to a section of the Schlee War or the Great Road, which was one of the, the, the great routeways of ancient Ireland. Um, the Suck also acted as a natural boundary and in fact marked the border between the counties of Galway and Roscommon up until the 19th century and it still marks the, the baronial boundaries, so the boundary between the barony of Moycarn and the bar barony of Clonmacnoun, and it marks the civil, uh, the, the border of the civil parishes of Priya and uh, Kilcluny. So as part of the wild river system, uh, the sub provided access to vast areas of land um, in the west of Ireland, and in tandem with the Shlee War, enabled people in the past to establish settlements, trade routes, and eventually church sites and so on along its route. So in Ballinasloe, sorry, or it's the next slide there, in Ballinasloe, it's no coincidence that a series of castles and defences were built next to it, emphasising its strategic importance as a territorial, as a frontier, really, uh, basically. So that's just a map, um, that's Larkin's map, if any of you are familiar with it at the time. It dates to the early part of the 19th century, so about 1819. And you can see, it's just the Galway side at that stage, so, you can see the river um, to one side, the, uh, the town, um, what, was, what the town looked like at that stage. And you can also see part of the war there that comes down uh, through the town and just goes a poor boy passing uh, a champion there and crossing at the ford in Toy Rush. Um, so I think the next slide there, Bernie, is actually, it's just a, a quick example of, um, just to show you, this is, um, you're probably familiar with it, the castle site out in River Street, um, or Dolan's uh, Vexes. So you're probably familiar, you can see the circle of the flanking tower there in the corner, the walls around it, um, and it's surrounded by water as well. And next to it then is Ballinasloe Bridge, which is absolutely remarkable. You know, for a bridge that was built in 1570, during the Elizabethan period, it's still in use today. Okay, so next one then again, Bernie, thanks. Um, so today, Society Street is one, of the, it's one of the main streets in the modern town but it's located in the townland of Town Parks. But the older name for this area is, is Dun, Dunlow, or Dunlow, which incorporates the Irish name for fort, or Dun. Um, Lo, we contacted the Place Names Commission during the project, and they have translated Lo meaning cut off or hacked off. So the traditional site of Dunlow is thought to be in and around the area of the present St. Michael's Church, and its supposed location was shown to the great uh, Gaelic scholar, John O'Donovan, during the course of the Ordnance Survey in 1837. So his guide at the time was a man called old Dr. Kelly, who was 74 when um, O'Donovan met him in 1837. And O'Donovan um, recorded in his notes that uh, Dr. Kelly had taken great trouble to show him the site of the ancient fort of Dunlo. And he goes on to say, it is now just a face with which he saw in good presentation about 30 years ago. Its site was occupied by the RC Chapel, within and without the enclosure of which part of, ran, part of its ramparts may still be traced. So that account, as I said, was written in 1837. But um, during this project, there was quite a lot of background research done, and it seems to me that it's far more likely that the site of Dunlow is this feature here, which for me has the, the, um, the laser pointer on. Can you see there's a kind of a circular enclosure around the summit of Church Hill? So um, at its centre then you have um, the precursor, one of the precursors of the present St. John's Church, 
So that was the Board of First Fruits Chapel um, that's in the centre of it there, and that was built around 1818, I think. Um, now, around it, you've got this enclosure. That's probably the, you know, the churchyard wall um, part of it. But that churchyard wall, if you go to the next way, I'm sorry, is actually sitting on a rampart or a, a bank of ostensibly a ring fort. So you can see here, um, on your left, is it? You can see the ivy clad churchyard wall that's standing on this high kind of bank, that ranging rod in the photograph is two metres high. So it's standing on this high bank, there's kind of a flat area, and there's a second bank then again. So that looks to me like a ring fort or a hilltop enclosure. They usually date to between about 400 to 1000 AD, and it fits perfectly in to the description uh, of, of, of uh, the below. Um, so it's, you know, on the map, it's, it's too late to show you now, but it's approximately 45 metres in overall diameter, which is quite, um, quite large. Um, as well as that, I should also say that um, the more banks that these boats had, the more important they were, the, the higher the status they were. So, um, you know, that kind of reflects the, the nature of the, um, the area at the time as well. And Lachlan, in his book, of course, was, um, referred to the um, to Church Hill. He, he of course, the old name for it is not a boom. A lot of people still uh, still call it by that. And that means the Nakadun is Knock on Dun, which is the hill of the fort as well. Um, so I think that it, not that I would um, ever question the great Gaelic scholar John O'Donovan, but I, sometimes he did make mistakes, and I think in this case that he mistook the RC chapel for the Church of Ireland one, and that his account in his letters in 1837 actually referred to the site here. So, okay, so let's get back then uh, to Society Street. Um, uh, during the course of the project, a number of people from the town reported that human remains had been found on the street uh, in the 1960s. So sometimes um, the teller of the story said that the burials were, you know, famine victims or murder victims or soldiers killed during the Battle of Ockham. And very occasionally um, they were at the remains of the Black and Tans. However, we had a couple of credible witnesses. You know, as archaeologists, we hear this all the time. So, you know, about burials and you know people kind of not being buried, buried in cemeteries, but buried kind of elsewhere. But in this case, so many people had said, had told me the story that you know that there there had to be something in it. Um, and one local man um, actually came up to me one day, and he had seen. Um, a skeleton on the street in the 1960s. And he was coming home from school, he was going to the tech at the time. He was coming home from school, saw a bit of a commotion on Society Street, and went, cycled his bike over to it, had a look, saw the skeleton, never forgot it, and went home. And that kind of information actually subsequently was passed on to us by the National Museum. So they had um, a report uh, on their files um, about a burial that was found during the construction of um, or during, during some ESB work on the street. And Professor, the late Professor Rin, uh, who was working in the museum at the time, he actually came down to have a look at the, the burial. And he left it where it was, didn't take any notes, which was kind of typical if you knew him, and didn't record the location. So, um, so you know, we were, we were kind of, you know, we were kind of left to kind of pondering things. But basically, that was in May 1968, and just over 50 years later, in May, 2020, I was watching a machine uh, digging a trench on the side of the street there in Society Street, just at the junction of Church Hill. And I noticed a human femur, which is a, the leg bone, uh, sticking out of the side of the trench. So we had to stop work for a while and have a look and see what was there. And it turned out that, that was the first indication, basically, um, of the remains of a cemetery um, that had pretty much lain almost directly underneath the footpath. Um, for you know, at least 300 years. So I'm just this now is a little bit technical, and I'm going to apologise for it. But this is an archaeological plan um, of what was found. So what you're looking at now is as if you're looking down on it. It's like an area of you would like. Um, so you can see what we found. We found um, your. I want to get my left and my right mixed up, but on your left hand side, you can see a stone well. Enclosed by a later wall. Can you show that burning the thing? Yeah. 
Yeah, so the stone well is that. Yeah, it's kind of D-shaped. It was enclosed by a later wall, which is kind of a wider wall all around it. And you can see the yellow, um, uh, high, the yellow areas there are, are the location of the burials. Um, so where it is as well, it's very clear. It's just outside Supermax, uh, just under the football, outside Supermax. Um, so we had to stop work for a while, as I said, and we had to have a look at it. Um, the area had been heavily impacted by previous works um, and services and so on. Um, but there was enough there um, really to warrant an excavation. So what we might do then is before we get to the, the juicy bit, we might have a look at the well and the well house. As, that's the next slide there, Bernie. Um, so the slide, yeah. So you can see Supermax there, you can see the, the step going into it, the red brick, you know, is the, the underneath the foundations of the building. Now, it's a little bit hard to look at this. I, I'm so used to looking at these, but I, I, I can't go on. See where it says C806? Well, that's the upper, an upper enclosing wall. Um, and it had a possible internal step, which you can see is marked there as well, on your right-hand side. So you can see that the feature is in very poor condition and it has been impacted by the services. You can see all those black kind of ducts there as well, the, the hydrant. Um, so the upper wall was constructed from uh, rubble masonry and it was bonded with a lime mortar and it enclosed... Is that somebody's phone? Sorry. No, sorry. Can you hear that? No. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So um, you can see, if you go to the next slide, there, I'm sorry. You can see that. So that's the upper wall. And you can see here that it enclosed a well. So can you see, you can make out the stone wall built to courses, it's actually dry stone. Do I need to keep your feet on that? No, no, no it's the bit. Oh, it's the bit of the bottom, okay. You can stop around. Okay, sorry, can you hear me now? Okay. Um, okay. Grant, so look at, yeah, so look, you can see the, basically the well there, the, 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 you can see it's made from rubble and stone, so chunks of rubble and stone, laid to courses, so it's built up in a wall, and it's stuck in under all of this ducting. Um, it's in very, very poor condition as well. So, what we noticed then was that the well had been covered in, it was backfilled, infilled, um, and during the excavation, when we were exposing it, we noted that it had been infilled with a lot of building rubble, so masonry, mortar, slate fragments, um, and wall plaster and stuff like that. Now, it's possible that that infill material came from somewhere else because there was a lot of um, construction work on the street, but it seems more logical that the semicircular wall, so the upper wall, represented the remains of a well house. So a well house basically was a covered, a structure that covered a well with a roof on it. And the fill then in the, the well itself um, occurred as a result of its demolition. So a number of well houses have been recovered or have been recorded from wells around the country, so say Bridget's Well, if any of you are familiar with it in the scanner, and Tullamore then in Ross Circuit in County Mayo. So uh, I think Bernie, if you show the next slide there, you can actually see uh, yeah, so you can kind of see there the curving wall, can you see that? Um, the step down and the, that's the rubble that was inside it, it's, it's all covered up. It would have actually been easier to show you on the, uh, you know, when we were doing the excavation while it was there, but the photographs kind of don't really get to it um, at justice. So no dated artifacts were found, um, but excavation indicated that both the well and the well house are pre 19th century in date. So it's possible that it was just a water source, but the proximity of the burials to the well seems to suggest that it may have had some ecclesiastical association. So in essence, it was a holy well. It seems unlikely, though, to modern eyes, uh, that burials were placed in proximity to drinking water due to the risk of con contamination. Now, we don't know for certain it was a holy well, but it seems most likely that it is. Um, the other thing about it is that much of this wall and the well itself were preserved in situ, so we left them alone, we didn't have to disturb them. And you can still see the location is actually marked in the footpath outside Supermax. Um, you can see the contrasting paving stones on the um, on the footpath there. Okay, so we'll go to the next slide then, we'll move on to the cemetery itself. Um, so, um, during the course of ex the excavation on Society Street, 10 articulated burials, burials 
So articulate means stretched out, basically, um, in varying states of preservation were uncovered, as well as a large quantity of disarticulated human bones. So disarticulate basically means just scattered around the place. Um, so the burials, as was the case with the well and well house, have been seriously impacted by modern utility services, as well as the construction of society street during the 18th and 19th centuries. Bone samples, you can go to the next slide there, Bernie. So this is SK3 and SK4 uh, following their excavation. And you can actually see SK3 there, it's going on under the building. So that's how we know that we only got really a fragment or you know, a section of the cemetery that originally it would have been much uh, much more extensive. Um, so these, uh, SK4 then, um, we, we took two bone samples basically, um, and one of them was from SK4 in the photograph. They were submitted for radiocarbon dating and isotope analysis, and the dates indicated that the cemetery was in use during the later medieval and early post-medieval period. So uh, between approximately the 15th and the 17th centuries. Um, we had an osteoarchaeologist, Dr. Linda Lynch, look at the assemblage, so that's all the bone from the excavation. Um, she identified um, an habitual clay pipe smoker from the skeleton assemblage, and this provided us with some further evidence for dating. Uh, tobacco smoking is said to have been introduced to Ireland by Sir Walter Raleigh during his time as the Mayor of York in 1588, and it's thought to have gained popularity very quickly. So using that information, the introduction of tobacco in the late 16th century therefore indicates that this one, one of the other burials uh, was, um, one of the other skeletons, was, or one of the other burials was placed there sometime after that date. So Linda um, indicated that at least 18 individuals were present. So I have got to say to you as well that, that the area that we excavated measured about seven and a half meters um, long by about four and a half meters wide. It was a very small area. Um, so we got quite a bit of information out of it. Um, so it identified at least 18 individuals uh, comprising adult males, adult females, adult females, young adults, juveniles, and two preterm infants who may have been twins. So all of the burials that were found were under 45 years of age, which is quite young really. Uh, dental analysis revealed information on the health and occupational habits of some of the individuals in common with research. Okay, so the physical size of the adults compared favourably to examples from elsewhere in Ireland, although the female skeletons were slightly smaller, but this may just reflect a bias in the sample. The in situ burials had a northwest southeast alignment, which is within the broad west east orientation associated with Christian beliefs. Although, although there was evidence for one burial, SK3, partially truncating another SK4, which you can see in the slide, the graves were well spaced and appear to have been laid out in rows. This indicates that they must have been marked above ground, although no evidence for this survived. The graves themselves were simple rectangular pits, a number of which were edged with stone, as you can see in the slide, and no evidence for coffins was noted. Ancient belief. I'm sure you're all familiar with Tutankhamun and the tombs, where they stuffed the pyramids full of all of these, you know, things that the people were bringing on, to them, on with them into the next life. And this is essentially the same kind of belief, or kind of continuation of that tradition. Um, now, it's as I said, it's unusual in burials of this date, but it's not unknown. So there's a couple of examples in Ireland, and actually, sorry, in um, in Ishkalki down in Loch Derg, um, that was excavated by Ian Dupuyer, and he found a similar example, similar found similar examples of this in burials that are the same date as, as our own. So really, it's just evidence for continuity of belief. Now, that was always, I have to say as well, that wasn't something that was always approved of by the church, but people continued to do it, um, you know, because that was, that was essentially what they believed in. Okay, Bernie, so you can see actually that's another one. That, that was the stone that was in that lady's hand. Um, you can see the stone there. Um, they're all the finger bones. Um, yeah, that's it. So we go on to the next one. Absence of sugar. I wanted to show you this as well, actually, because it kind of... Um, it really demonstrates, you can see the street there, that was taken by Robert French, the photographer, around the year 1900. Um, so, like everything is recognisable in it as it is today. And you can see the terrace of houses, the red brick terrace of houses here were 
testing for Marxism, the, the chemist and so on today. Um, so those houses were built around 1890 and they were actually built on the site of earlier houses. And it's those earlier houses that would have actually removed the cemetery um, and destroyed the cemetery originally. And you can see as well how level the street is. And that, that's evidence for this levelling or for this kind of clearing of the area to, to prepare for a formally laid out neat and tidy uh, town. Okay, uh, you can go on to the next one there, Bernie, I think. Yeah, so the grave tokens, um, the stones, weren't the only things that were found uh, in the graves. And in keeping with the great tradition of archaeology of everything showing up at the last minute, uh, my colleague Louise Callaghan uh, uncovered a well-preserved paternoster or set of rosary beads during the final days of the excavation, actually just about three days before we were due to finish. So the beads were wrapped around the feet and lower legs of SK10, uh, the female age between 35 and 44 years. So you can see them there, you can see that her feet and her ankles and her toe bones, and you can, can you pick out the beads there, they're kind of indicated, that's it, yeah. Um, you can go on to the next one there, Bernie, thanks. Um, so in all, 67 beads were found. Uh, they vary in size, now they're quite small, but they do vary in size. They're made from animal bone, and they include, there you can see at the bottom, a tubular and a conical, um, a tubular and conical examples. So they're likely to have formed elements of a cross uh, on the set of those rubies. And some of them were actually polished as well. You can see they're decorated, they're called incised lines on it, and the holes obviously then up in the string went through to, to, to hold it together. And as I said, you can see it's very clear that they're made from bone, from animal bone. And because you can see the, can you see kind of the pot marks, you know, it's uh, characteristic of, of bone. Okay, you can watch the next one there, Bernie. So the beads then, um, appear to represent a six-decade rosary of a type known as a corona, which became popular in the 15th century. So it came out of the street in Rome named Via de Coronari. For any of you who know Rome, it's just behind Piazza Navona. So these are our beads here on the left. Um, they're set out like that, um, just to, for illustration purposes, really, just to show you what they, they... I'm not going to say what they would have looked like, because I'm going to take the blame for this. I actually set them out, but I had, I had counted them incorrectly. There should be 10 small beads in between the bigger beads, but that's the way I counted them. That's, it's just really for illustration purposes. So the set on the white then, um, it's not a complete set. There's 43 beads there. They were found during the excavation of a house in Middle Street in Galway in 1987 by Miriam Klein. Now, they're quite similar in that they're, you know, they seem to be made from the same material, they're similar in size, but you can see there, right at the top, that the beads are, are different, they're, they're not exactly the same. Um, so I think we can go to the next one there, Bernie. It's remarkable that they were actually so well preserved, given how close they were to the concrete footpath and the gas mains, the water mains, and all of that kind of stuff, like it really is, it's, a, it's astonishing. So I think that these are more similar to our beads, um, to the Bangalore slow beads. You can see the cross there at the bottom, and the incised lines, the shape of the, the, the beads as well, it's more similar. And these beads were recovered from the wreck of the Mary Rose, which was Henry VIII's ship. Um, it's like in 1585, I think. Um, and it's kind of ironic that the beads were found on Henry VIII's ship, which was constructed in Ireland from Irish wood or oak fell from Irish forests. But um, Henry VIII had actually attempted to ban the use of rosary beads twice, but people just basically ignored it. And these were found on his ship. So Pater Nostras um, consist of sets of beads, usually in some symbolic number, um, threaded on a cord or a string, and they were used for counting repetitions of pairs. Of, of prayers, sorry. So each bead represented a prayer. So the smaller beads would have represented the uh, Hail Mary, and the larger beads then would have represented the um, the Our Father. Um, using beads as an, an aid uh, for memory emerged during the medieval period in Europe, and may have evolved from the custom of using stones as prayer counters. 
And that's a practice that you still see in Ireland today, particularly around holy wells, um, or sometimes ecclesiastical, uh, you know, in ecclesiastical settings or pilgrimage sites. Um, by the 15th century, their form and the order in which the prayers were said had evolved into the rosary, a devotional prayer dedicated to the cult of Mary. And with the backing of the Council of Trent and the Dominican Order, who really kind of pushed uh, the rosary, the structure and elements of the rosary were standardized by the 16th century. So the beads would have been made, or the rosary beads would have been made by pater nostrars or pater nostrarii, or the turners of beads. And the raw materials that they used varied. Um, so some of the earliest and most popular examples were actually made, like the bamboo stones, they were made from bone, the jaw and limb bones of animals. Um, there can be no doubt either about the role that the sets of beads played in the economy of what would be now termed a sort of religious or devotional tourism. So people basically went on pilgrimage, as they do today, to Rome, Santiago, wherever. Um, and many of the bead making workshops were located on streets close to important churches and centres of pilgrimage. So in 14th century Rome, for example, Peter Nostrums sold their wares, as they do today, from the booths and the steps and in the area around St. Peter's. Now, at the moment, I'm going to say research is ongoing, um, so I don't have an example of a bead making workshop in Galway or in, in this area. Um, but we know that rosary beads were made here during the medieval period. And the types of rosaries then made in Ireland were, for, were said to have been influenced by um, Spanish, um, by examples that, that, that were made in Spain. Now, also having said that, there's nothing to say that our beads weren't, that they didn't come from the continent and that they were you know, something that somebody brought back to their loved one, you know, um, just like we do today, really. So this is, um, this lovely lady here is the Infanta Isabella uh, de Bourbon of um, Spain. So she's a 16th century figure, and she is wearing her rosary beads as jewellery. So sometimes people wore them as jewellery. It was kind of an, an obvious sign of their piety and also for, for decoration. Um, the cross is kind of similar as well, so I, I can't remember actually the date of that picture, but it's, it's, it's mid-16th century anyway. Um, so the beads, you can see there as well that they're held together, um, and they would have been held together using brightly coloured silk, or wool, or linen, or cord. Um, and sometimes they'd have a tassel or a pomander, you know, one of those things for, because for the, you know, to, so that you wouldn't have to smell the, the stench that came from the, the uh, the medieval streets, you had this commander and you could kind of take a sniff of it and all the, the bad stuff would go away. Um, so, so, yeah, so they, that's what they, you know, she doesn't have a tassel in hers, she has a cross in the end, but sometimes you'd see them in, in paintings uh, decorated with a tassel. So, just as the different stones were imbued with certain spiritual and quasi magical powers, as the grave tokens were, the colour of the thread used also retained a particular symbolism. So, red thread was a very popular choice, and it represented blood, destiny, and the power of the Pentecost. Um, and as I said, I never get over how remarkable it is that they survived in the ground when they were, you know, it's, it's really great to see. Now, before we finish here, I'm actually quite close to the end, so can you, can you just go to the next slide? Um, uh, we know that we only got part of the cemetery, and it must have been more extensive. It, there's, there's no question of it, really, and it probably extended all the way up uh, Churchill. Um, but there was some, em uh, some evidence turned up, actually, in April 2019, and at the time, these are post holes, so they're the remains of posts, wooden posts that would have been in the ground. So at the time, we kind of couldn't really decide what they were. I thought it was a Bronze Age house because I'm more of a prehistorian than a, a medievalist, but we just weren't sure. But they were found pretty much in front of the burials. So I think now that this actually represents the remains of a wooden fence or a kind of a palisade that demarcated the limit of the cemetery itself. It kind of makes more sense. Um, unfortunately, as well, just due, due to the nature of the ground, we couldn't get any dating evidence from it. But they're so they're so close to each other, really, you'd, you'd have to say they were associated. Okay, Bernie. <coughs> so, uh, so I suppose the, the other question that we asked ourselves is why was the cemetery here? Like, why was it placed where it was? Um, because other than the Presbyterian Church, which was 
built in 1845, and the church that we're in here today, uh, St. Gabriel's, which was built in 1864, there's no record of a church or a graveyard on um, Society Street. Um, although records do show that the land was owned by the church uh, during the medieval period. How and ever, if you have a look at this map here, so I've taken this from Father Egan's book, um, and it's, I think it's Petty's map, um, and it's, it dates to the mid, I think it's 1663 is the date of this map. Um, so you can see kind of, can you see where Balance Slow is there burning, sorry. You can see the castle, you know, the area around it on, let's say, to the, the right of the river. And then you have the Island Slope Bridge, the Tudor Bridge, which was built in 1570, crossing the river. Then you have a hill with a church on the top of it. Now, Father Egan thought that that may have represented the church out in Kilcunia, beside um, out near Barry Wards, out near the garden centre. But it's more likely. You can see the, the smaller um, structures there just beside, yeah? So they appear to represent houses. So that looks to me as if it's in an urban setting. So I think that that church was a church that was located on the summit of Church Hill, and it would have been a precursor of the, um, you know, the, the, the various, um, you know, you'd say that would have been a precursor of St. John's Church. Um, and the houses then, obviously, there, we know that there was a population there uh, in Balance over time because they're buried in the cemetery, and that just represents the fact that, that it was an urban area at that time. There was a town here at that time. Okay, um, and we should also say, actually, before we pass on, so very often, you know, place names are good indicators of um, the use or the, you know, that they're good indicators of what happened in a place in the past. And the Irish name for uh, church Hill is Knockham Temple, which is the, the church on the hill, or the, the hill with the church on it. And the word chapel is very unusual, and it's, it's, it's more usually associated with parish churches of post-12th century date as well. So that kind of, they all kind of, the kind of indicators that there was probably a church there um, at the time, the, the, the burials and the well um, as, as well. Okay, so we're almost finished, I'm sure you're happy to hear. Um, I just, before we go, um, I see a couple of people um, in the audience um, that I just want to, to sing their praises um, before we finish. Because in, um, all of our artifacts um, go to the museum, essentially. So the National Museum is the repository for all artifacts in the state. So everything that's found goes there and it's, it's taken care of uh, by the state. And that includes, and that will include our, our set of rosary beads. And I felt quite strongly that, you know, it is such a shame because when I was on the streets, I met so many people. Everyone was so interested in the archaeology. Everyone had something to say. I felt very strongly that it was a shame that people probably won't ever get to see these. They go to the museum. They may be put on display at some stage, but it's more likely they just get put into a drawer. So I approached um, the men's shed um, in August and I just asked them would they be interested in making a replica set of beads to put on display in Balmaslow for kind of forever, or for as long as they can be put on display, I suppose. So the men's shed basically ran with the idea. So this is a photograph of some of the, the people from it. So Iggy, I see him down there as well, he's in the photograph. So Iggy made a set of beads and he wanted them extra burning. And I think you'll agree that they're outstanding they're absolutely outstanding, and they really represent, you know, what, what, what we found. So we're hoping that they'll be presented to the library and exhibited publicly um, in the next while, and that people will be able, you know, even tourists in the town will be able to see the set of beads that was, was found here. So I, I haven't stopped singing their praises because they took an idea. I wasn't even sure if it was the right thing to do, but they took this idea and they ran with it. And they were absolutely, they couldn't have been more accommodating or kind. Um, they, they, they really ran with the idea. So, okay, so um, on that emotional note, I think we're almost ready to conclude. And I just want to say that the excavation, so I'm talking to you today, but obviously I form part of the team. And um, the excavation that we carried out, it, marked, it marks a significant step forward in the understanding of the earlier history of the town and in particular the ecclesiastical history, as well as providing insights to the broader context 
of burial and, and ritual in County Galway during the late medieval and post-medieval period. So the ensuing research then contributes significantly to the understanding of the early history of the modern town and its people. So it's pretty much just like putting a piece of a bigger jigsaw in place. And I was, I'm still amazed that, um, that I got a chance to do it as well. So I was very privileged uh, to be part of it. So that's it. So our last slide then is just to say thanks. So um, there's too many people to thank. So um, I just want to thank my colleagues at Atlantic Archaeology, obviously, to John Killian, who's a major of the town. We worked with him with Saya and the ground crew who were outstanding and funny, funny people to work with every day. Ryan Hanley was a consulting engineer for the project, the rest of the Goldman County Council, Irish Water, Iggy, Charles, and the men's shed, forever in your debt. Um, so Bernie and community archaeology as well, and Abby and Green and the library staff, thank you so much. And also the people of uh, Bangladesh as well. So Sinead.